Good afternoon, it's Wednesday, January 6th. I'm Anthony Logue with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Mikhail Allen, the boy who was flown to New York for treatment after being attacked by dogs in St. Dacre, St. Anne last November, is now back home. Six-year-old Mikhail landed at the Sangster International Airport yesterday after undergoing several surgeries at the Montefiore Hospital in New York. His mother, Shireen Brindley, is happy to be home with her son. She expressed appreciation for the assistance she has received. Mikhail is alert. So all I can say, thanks to all who have done even a little dot in Mikhail's life, not even to mention the persons who have done a lot. So all I can say, thanks to, to every single whole who have prayed, even a word of encouragement. I'm just saying thank you, thank you, and to God be the glory, great things he has done. She says Mikhail is scheduled to do follow-ups at the Bustamante Hospital for Children within the next few weeks. So from there, he will follow on. I don't know what, what will be from there, but I got some paperwork to bring to Bustamante. So the surgeon said from there, I will know what is next. And as it relates to his ear, what did they tell you about his ear? Oh, they said that um, he's in the healing process now, and the, it is too much for him to do. He cannot do an next surgery now. It is too much for him to do, so they're sending him home for him to heal, do his checkups, and then, well, the surgeon said he will communicate, so they will see when. Stricter measures for state care facilities across the island are being implemented. This following the revelation that employees at several children's homes have tested positive for COVID-19, including at the Maxfield Park Children's Home in Kingston. O'Shane Masters reports. Twelve staff members assigned to the Maxfield Park Children's Home in Kingston have tested positive for COVID-19. In December, the Ministry of Health tested all 92 wards and 84 staff members for the virus. Chairperson of the home, Empress Golding, says testing at the facility was prompted following the revelation that one member of staff tested positive for the virus. That staff member was sent home for self-isolation and the unit in which the staff member was attached was also put into isolation as well as it was deep cleaned and sanitized. Remember our caregivers, our staff, they go home every day and come back on a shift system with over 84 staff members. So that's a lot of people coming in and out. And so what we did was protect that area and then sitting down with management, we said, you know what? Why don't we just test everybody to make sure? Because you never know until you test the entire population. After testing the entire population at the facility, it was revealed that there were no confirmed cases in the children. Mrs. Golding says going forward, follow-up testing will be done along with more stringent measures. As a board of management, we are going to be following up and we will continue testing as much as we can, as long as the ministry keeps coming in, to make sure that we um, know for sure if anybody has the virus or the COVID-19 disease. We're just making sure that we protect the children by educating them, educating the staff, and making sure everybody's following the proper protocol and procedures that the Ministry of Health has put forward. We're working with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, and our governing agency, CPFSA, to make sure that PPEs, sanitization, bleach, and I'm begging and I'm asking and I'm writing, and they're giving us what we need to make sure that we are safe. So it's a teamwork making our Maxwell Park COVID-free um, dream works. Meanwhile, Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton has confirmed that there are other state care facilities across the island where employees have tested positive for COVID-19. Well, the truth is we have had others, you know. Um, I, I, we, we had a, an infirmary in Manchester over the last couple of days. It, it, it has become a routine now where we have ongoing surveillance, where we do sample testing, at, in certain institutions that we classify as vulnerable institutions, children, homes, infirmaries is being two, the prisons and so on. Once you detect positive cases, you move in and you test everyone and you make adjustments. And then we go back to normality. So the Maxfield Park Children's Home, of course, is always going to be concerning 
but it, it, it's not the only institution, even at this particular point in time, that we have had to intervene. And it's just that we have not really announced every single one that we have had at issue with. Dr. Tufton says containment measures have been implemented to halt the spread of the virus in those facilities. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. Another COVID-19 death was recorded in Jamaica yesterday. The latest case is a 31-year-old man from Hanover. This has increased the country's death toll to 306. Meanwhile, 84 new COVID-19 cases were recorded yesterday. The country's case count now stands at 13,330. Their ages range from 3 to 90 years. Clarendon and St. Catherine each recorded 18 cases, followed by St. Anne and Kingston and St. Andrew with 17 each. The number of people hospitalized with a respiratory illness has increased to 92. Seven are in critical condition. There are renewed calls for parents to take more responsibility as it relates to ensuring their children participate in virtual learning. This follows an increase in the number of students who are now seeking employment rather than an, rather than an education. Kelisha Williams tells us more. There are more reports from high schools across the island of students who have stopped attending classes and have taken on jobs due to the disruption caused by COVID-19. Principal of Frome Technical High School in Westmoreland, Norman Allen, says based on information he has received, the fallout due to the lack of classes will be more significant than initially expected. He disclosed that he has lost students due to their socioeconomic challenges. These students have gone on to become employed. I have 18 year olds. I have students between 16 and 17 years. These are young adults. When when I have a sixth form student who is out of school, that child is who is struggling, you know, financially to make it through, but is making the sacrifice because both that child and his or her parents want them to go to college. When you have them out there, they are going to go and work. So I have a number of grade 11, grade 12, grade 13 students who are working. Mr. Allen pointed to other factors which are pulling students away from the classroom. They were already struggling in school. They go and work. They find some odd jobs that keep them occupied. They make some money. Hard to come back. The other thing is, that does not, that does not hide. Scamming might be on the, on the down low. But it's still, it's still a reality in this, in this part of the island. In the meantime, Education Minister Favel Williams is urging parents to be more responsible in ensuring their children access education during the COVID-19 pandemic. And during this pandemic, there is more responsibility on parents because their children are at home with them for the most part. And so, you know, we're, we've been calling on parents just to be more vigilant. Um, we understand the challenges. Minister Williams says she has personally noticed several children engaging in other activities during the period dedicated for learning. What I've seen and what I've heard is that the children are in the home. They may be used to go to the shop or to do housework, um, to do babysitting and so on um, within the home. And that's what I'm calling to the attention of parents that during school time, it is school time. Despite the trend, she says the government is not yet considering disciplinary measures for such parents, but does not rule out the possibility. Kalisha Williams, TVJ News. And it's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back. Continuing the news. A 17-year-old boy has been arrested and charged by the Westmoreland police with rape and grievous sexual assault for an incident in November 2020. Reports from the Darleston police are that the teen and the complainant were allegedly in a relationship. It's further alleged that the complainant visited the teen's house in Grange Hill where he had sexual intercourse with her against her consent. A report was subsequently made to the police and an investigation carried out. On Monday, January 4, the teen was arrested and placed before an identification parade where he was positively identified. A teenager is among three persons facing firearm charges in Montego Bay, St. James. They are being charged with illegal possession of firearm and ammunition following a joint police military operation in Glendavon in the parish on New Year's Day. The accused are 23-year-old Ricardo Frey, otherwise called Cardo of Hendon Norwood in the parish, 
29-year-old Ravandor Sutherland, otherwise called Skinny, of Dallas, Glendavon in the parish, and, si and a 16-year-old boy of a Glendavon address in St. James. Reports are that about 12.15 a.m., members of the security forces were on duty in the area when a group of individuals ran upon the approach of the lawmen. The accused were held, and a .45 firearm with seven rounds of ammunition was seized. The accused were charged following a question and answer session. Their court dates are being finalized. Business and tourism extraordinaire Gordon Wood Stewart, who died on Monday in the U.S., has been lauded for his contribution to the field of aviation. He led the iconic Air Jamaica in a time where the carrier faced great competition and financial turmoil. Krista Campbell has more. When Air Jamaica found itself in a bad financial position in 1994, Gordon Butch Stewart led a team of investors known as the Air Jamaica Acquisition Group to save the airline. Of the 70% stake bought, Butch was the majority shareholder with more than a 30% stake. This was a time when the national carrier faced financial hardships, regulatory challenges, and strong competition from U.S. airlines for passengers coming to Jamaica. Butch understood this, and he understood it in terms of the importance of a national carrier, which had to be able to transmit it from a point to point, country to country. And in that context, Air Jamaica was the main flag bearer that would carry us for the tourism and the in, in the industry that we call entertainment. So that in that context, when he stepped in and took over Air Jamaica in order to make the whole tourist industry expand and grow, it was an important element of development. He transformed the iconic Lovebird into a brand many grew to love. From the distinct orange, blue, and bright yellow livery to an on-time track record, new routes, and a frequent flyer program, some say it was almost a new airline. He was quite um, good at marketing and caused the, the airline to, to grow significantly and the popularity of the airline to grow. Now, when you want to assess how popular Air Jamaica was during that 10 years that he had it, is when you go to some of the, let me call it out of the way parts of the, the world, and pilots there were asking, when is Air Jamaica coming back? This is after he had handed back Air Jamaica to the government. A 1998 New York Times article credits Butch for his innovation in the Jamaican aviation sector. In that same year, the airline increased its share of passengers flown to the island to 46% from 22% in 1994. This accounted for almost half of the passengers which came to Jamaica, a shift in market share from American Airlines. He also managed to double the carrier's revenues in three years, but the airline was still in a difficult financial position. Butch Stewart was, however, credited as always being optimistic, even in times of significant challenge. He believed in the power of a local airline in driving the local economy, a belief he held even after selling his stakes in the carrier back to the Jamaican government in 2004. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. Residents of Shooters Hill in Bull Bay, St. Andrew, were able to say their final goodbyes to the father and daughter who lost their lives after their house collapsed during heavy rainfall last October. But in the midst of saying goodbye, an appeal is being made for parents to build strong relationships with their children. It was a somber mood at the funeral of Romeo Leachman and his 15-year-old daughter, Sanique, on Sunday in Bull Bay, St. Andrew. Scores of people turned out to say their final goodbye. The two were laid to rest at the Sunset Burial Park in the parish. For many, the pain was too much to bear and the social distancing seemed to be buried. Romeo and Sanique died after their house collapsed in Shooterzil during heavy rainfall last year, October. In the early hours of the morning of October 23rd, Mr. Leachman and Sanique were at home when a landslide occurred. It swept a wall into the wooden structure in which they resided. When news broke 
on October 23rd of the tragedy, it ran like wildfire across the various social media platforms. And we hoped and wished for that Sanique and her father would be alive. Sanique, buried under the rubbles, was finally retrieved, and this brought some closure to what seemed impossible. The news that she is dead is still not real, as we are still in denial and do hope that one day we will see her neatly dressed in her Queen's uniform again. Mr. Leachman's body was found the same day underneath the rubble, and Sanique's body was found the following day. Sanique was a student at the Queen's High School who, according to her teachers, was eager to learn and was well-mannered. To her peers, she was that dear sister who will never be forgotten. To her teachers, school family and principal, Miss Jennifer Williams, a true queen. Well-mannered, calm, humble, are but a few words that best describes her demeanor. And I could go on and on. The half of the story has never been told. Patrons, especially those who were close to Sanik, used the opportunity to encourage parents to maintain a bond with their children. Let us pledge ourselves to talking to our young ones because we don't know if tomorrow another one even younger than Shanique, will be in that box. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. And here's a preview of what's coming up in this evening's health report. In the next edition of the health report, we'll look at New Year's resolution. People usually start by making goals to exercise, but by the second, third month, they drop off. What's the reason for that? You have to make very specific goals. On Monday morning, every, I'm going to take out my shoes, which should be on my bed, beside my bed on Sunday afternoon. That Monday morning, I'm 6.30, I'm going to go to the gym or go for that walk. And you, you tie that to waking up in the morning. So you are in your, your goal to make the exercise is supported. That's the health report this evening in primetime news. And now for today's healthy living tip. Outline your plan. Talk about it. Reward yourself. Track your progress. And don't beat yourself up. In news overseas, dozens of former lawmakers and opposition activists were arrested on Wednesday in Hong Kong on suspicion of violating the city's sweeping national security legislation. This is the biggest crackdown yet since the law was imposed in Beijing last year. More from the CNN. It is a day of dramatic and sweeping escalation under the national security law here in Hong Kong. On Wednesday, the city witnessed the biggest crackdown since the national security law was imposed by Beijing last year. Dozens of high-profile former lawmakers and activists have been arrested under the law in relation to last year's Democratic primary election. These include familiar faces in Hong Kong politics like Claudia Mo and Benny Tai. American lawyer John Clancy was also arrested. A U.S. citizen, Clancy could potentially be the first foreign citizen who does not also hold a Hong Kong passport to be arrested under the controversial new law. Uh, when the primary vote took place in July of last year, China's liaison office threatened that it might be deemed illegal under the national security law. Now, Hong Kong held a primary vote before without incident in 2018. And at the time of last year's vote, Hong Kong's top leader, Carrie Lam, warned that they may have breached the law, calling them, quote, so-called primaries. Now, six months on and in a new year, she is now calling for harmony. Every time there are quarrels in society, in fact, people pay a hefty price. That is why, for 2021, my biggest hope is for society to have harmony, so that the SAR government and other public bodies have more room to do concrete things for Hong Kong. To news in sports now, TVJ Sports understands that Guyanese all-rounder Ramaria Shepard has been pulled from the West Indies squad set to tour Bangladesh after testing positive for COVID-19. Now, Cricket West Indies are yet to make an announcement, but it is believed selectors are discussing a possible replacement. 
Shepard was a member of the West Indies A team, which toured New Zealand in December. The 26-year-old has played five one-day internationals and three T20s for the West Indies. And that's the Midday News. I'm Anthony Lugg. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.